I have to say as well, the world has changed in the last two or three years and to an unbelievable degree. Uh, I have a friend who works in the city of London, and uh, uh, he was telling me that uh, a few years ago, they wore their, 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 their red braces to work, their, their high-powered suits, their Rolexes. But over the last, uh, well, since about 2008, uh, some of the bankers have been uh, going to work uh, with changes of clothing and then changing in the changing rooms of the bank. And I asked him why, and he said, we, we don't want the people on the trains to know we work in a bank. <laughs> and can you imagine hearing that two or three years ago? It's, it's the, world, the world has changed. Now, um, it struck me as well from the, from the last speech um, that there is a connection, a very strong connection between the environmental crisis and the economic crisis. It seems to me it's, it's about an undervaluation of, of risk and an, an under, uh, a, a not very good uh, rating of, of assets. And so maybe what we need, and uh, I'm going to introduce the people um, as, as, I, as I start here, what we need uh, is from a former uh, Bank of Greece uh, manager, Mr. Arzinis, and also uh, uh, a, mis a minister in, 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 in the Greek government, uh, many different um, portfolios, the Minister of Economics and the Minister of Education. What we need is not just new bankers, but maybe we need a, a new economics. And, and a regulatory framework. Actually, the crisis uh, is not an economic crisis. It was a financial crisis. And uh, people believe that the markets are, are self-regulating. And uh, Grisman said that. And it was a great moment, I think, when he testified before the Congress after the crisis, that he said that for 40 years, I believe that the markets are, are self-regulating. And I was wrong. Now, what we need, actually, is a, a regulatory system in the context of modern world for capital movements and financing. Uh, we thought we had the central banks in the past, and we thought that we had a regulatory framework. When the banks were doing the regular business with the casino kind of banking that developed uh, in the recent years, we do need uh, a different regulatory system. And that regulatory system cannot be national. It's got to be global and international. So we have spent a lot of time talking about how the crisis had came up, but we haven't talked what we're going to do from now on. And what I'm afraid is that um, as time goes by, the bankers will wear their banking suits in their trains because memory is very short. And I think that we have to learn the lessons of the past and really address ourselves seriously to the question that uh, we do need a global regulatory system. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to, to move over to Catherine Marshall, uh, a long-time senior advisor at the World Bank, and I, I'm very happy we have uh, uh, at least one woman on the panel to fight against the, the massive testosterone that we heard uh, earlier on uh, from uh, Rick von der Plug. Um, I'd like to ask you, maybe the, I mean, we, we've mentioned this already, is there an end not just to the, the Washington consensus, but to really maybe even to the, the, the Anglo-Saxon economics uh, model of the last few years? There's a slow movement uh, towards this, but it's not a seismic shift uh, towards um, a new uh, global, global governance model. Uh, and it's going in a very bumbling way. I mean, you're seeing the shift from the G8 to the G20 uh, with all the dangers that that involves because when you have uh, more people at the table, you have less possibility, as we saw in Copenhagen, uh, to get away from the circus and towards um, the serious business. So there's a very slow recognition, a slow change uh, in habits. But I think that what we're facing is, uh, and this is one of the things that I think the crisis has brought out quite dramatically, is the weakness of global institutions. 
the global institutional structure. In other words, there really uh, there has been no uh, clear center where we're seeing uh, a link between the ideas which are floating around of what needs to be done and an impetus for action. Uh, and in a sense, we have the paralysis of analysis, the paralysis of, of the complexity. Uh, and it leads to what I see as a very present and immediate danger of the impetus to go back uh, to business as usual, uh, to miss, as everyone says, a crisis is too good an opportunity to miss. And I think we're right on the verge of, of doing that. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. I, um, we had to uh, reduce the, the, the length of this uh, session, but I, I must get this, this anecdote in, uh, uh, Dr. Jacques Pouz, because uh, I was very nervous when I met you uh, this time. And I'm sure you don't know about this, but uh, in the late 80s, in the early 90s, when the, the British anti-European hysteria was at its height, a, a less than intellectual newspaper, I think it was The Sun, um, uh, included uh, you. I, I, I'm not sure if you know about this, but uh, when I was still at university, uh, um, there, was, there was a headline that said, this man wants to be president over 60 million British people. And I, I remember this very clearly. It was your photograph was underneath. But perhaps even worse, underneath the photograph was, and he's a Luxemburger. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I'll have to search this out for you. you know. This seems to me that it, it, it misses the point somewhat, that uh, we need maybe European institutions. And I know that you're, you're not a proponent of, of centralization, of complete centralization of the EU. You, um, but it seems to me that we have a, a, a monetary federation or a monetary confederation, but we don't have a fiscal confederation in Europe. Is it time, and bearing in mind the recent uh, upheavals in the financial markets with the crisis with, the, with uh, Portugal, Spain, Greece, the attack of speculators, that we move the uh, European Union towards a more fiscal federalization as well as a monetary one? Thank you for remembering the early 90s. Uh, during this uh, period, uh, Europe had one president. It was the president of the council. Now it has three. <laughs> so uh, we, we, uh, what is the number that the American pre uh, president uh, call if he wants to speak to Europe? The problem remains the same. Uh, the question which is uh, before us, uh, how reforming the international financial system has been very well treated during the first two uh, conferences we heard this afternoon. And uh, we saw that the origin is a failure of the American supervisory system. This is the failure. and. Uh, we have to draw lessons from this failure. First, the Americans, I think they are doing that under uh, President Obama. And we have to do the same on this side of the Atlantic. And it, it's up to the European institutions to draw the right lessons. Uh, we have on our table a lot of uh, studies, a lot of reports. They have been mentioned partly. I would like to add to the De La Rosière report, which was the former French president of the Central Bank, uh, French Central Bank, and the Turner report on the UK side. On the basis of these reports, the European Commission has made a proposal to reform the regulatory supervisory system of the European banks, not only of the European banks, but also of the European insurances and uh, the non-bank financial institutions, the whole range of uh, financial services. And uh, the proposal of the Commission is in the last stages of decision. It's a navet between the European uh, Council, which is in this case the ECOFIN, 
the ministers of uh, economy and finance, and the European Parliament. And the last point of dispute in this uh, package is uh, the power of the regulators. Would they have the power of sanctions as had the high authority for coal and steel in the early 50s? It had the power to inflict sanctions to the steel and coal industries which did not follow the directives of the high authority. Now the big question is, will these three authorities of the European banking system as a whole have the power or not to inflict, to intervene uh, directly in a country, in a given country, and to inflict a sanction to a bank which it thinks has not respected the regulations. This is a problem which I have no answer for the time being, it w but the answer will be on the table in a few months when the, the Parliament and the, mini the ministers have taken their decision. I want to add one, one word. Uh, during the whole uh, conferences of this afternoon, I, I didn't hear the word rating agencies. So the rating agencies are one of the causes of the financial crisis because they didn't do their job. Lehman Brothers, which broke up, had a double A rating the day before uh, it went bankrupt. Funny May and Freddie Mac and AEG, which gave the stamp of uh, the United States on these nice packages with red ribbon, uh, Rick uh, spoke about, had uh, one uh, A or double A uh, ratings. So among the reforms, especially in the United States, because all these agencies are of American origin, they have to be looked after and they must do a more serious job in the future. Thank, thank you very much. Um, um, Mr. Martla, you inspired us with your uh, uh, recounting of becoming Prime Minister of Estonia at the age of 32, which made me rather disappointed about my own achievements uh, in, in life up to then. Uh, I'm several years behind schedule, uh, being Prime Minister of Britain. Um, so so let's, let's move that aside. Uh, also, as your, 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 your early career, your many years before becoming Prime Minister, uh, you were an economic historian. And I, I wonder if um, you, know, you can put maybe the financial crisis in perspective, in the, in the, the, the historical perspective, because this, this must seem... Uh, a very strange development uh, for Estonia that uh, you went through a, a, a crisis and a reform when leaving the Soviet Union and now we are faced only a few years later with um, the dot-com bubble and boom, the Asian crisis, the subprime crisis and the financial crisis. Was this the wrong time for Estonia to become a, a free market economy? Um, I must say it's significantly better to live in the cr permanent, or not in the permanent, but the crisis after crisis after crisis as in the Soviet Union, which was one crisis all the time. Uh, so it's a it's, it's lot of better now, <laughs> even with all the problems. Uh, but uh, seriously, um, as a historian, of course, uh, doing that the economy is going from crisis to crisis, it's normal. It's happened always. So you can... Um, when you're a historian and your country is running to the 10% or 11% or 12% growth in the year, you know only one thing, it goes badly in the near future because the crisis will just hit. And it happens whatever you do. Your problem is what you do in those good years, how you use these good years. Are you using them well or you are just speeding the problem? And so we have talked, um, and I think very rightly, on the, about the role of the banks, failure of the supervision system, failure of the rating agencies. But of course, we must 
talk on two more things, I think. One is failure of government, and the other is the failure of the, all of us, human beings. Because where it starts? It starts because we want to become more rich as we actually can. All this starts from the failures in our morals, in our ethics. That's where it starts. To think that the money and richness is the most important thing in our life. And whatever we talk, that's not so, nevertheless we do this. And then we have the governments who support this. Because they're making and pressing the banks to give the cheap loans for everybody who is walking into the bank to buy the house. That's what happened in the United States of America. I think uh, too less is talked about the mistakes of the Clinton administration in all this crisis. And not only talking about the supervision system, but talking as such. Because it was strongly encouraged and pressed, all this what happened. And when there was then no failure which was connection with this, then we got to the crisis. To be very frank, when we have had in Estonia the similar, so, so weak banking control system, we have got all our banks out immediately, as actually happened in our neighboring country, in Latvia. But uh, I am such a damned conservative. So I introduced the most tough regulation system in all the region for the banks. Our reserve demands were not only twice higher, but four times higher as normal in Europe. And uh, actually that, that was quite a good decision, as I say now, because there is something which must where you must handle very conservatively, and that's banking. And immediately when you get it go, that's, that happens what happened. And of course we must learn in all possible ways, not only hoping that when we now take the more money from the banks and we develop the regulatory system that saves us. No, we will go to the, to the next crisis quite quickly, whatever direction it can happen. I think when we want uh, to live at least we couldn't live without the crisis in economy, that's, at least it's never happened. But uh, we can have weaker crisis, and um, then we must change a lot of attitudes of the people and a lot of attitudes of the governments. And uh, at the same time, as historian, again I say this crisis is, is, has been actually, till now, so quite successful. When we compare the connection and the background of this crisis and the Great Depression and think on the results of the Great Depression in social, in politics, in everywhere, actually it could happen again. That's, that was quite possible. And there were, especially such of institutions as the European Union, were enormously useful. Without the European Union, the Europe has come to the, I don't want even to think where. And I think that's, that's a fact, but again, we don't want to talk very much because it sounds too, too positive. But we must know what worked and what didn't work. And I must say the European Union worked in this crisis when we have had the protectionist. And what was the other thing what worked was globalization. When we had moved the world to the, the, to the trade barriers and to the protectionist, then we have got to the real crisis, all of us. That was not done, and thanks to this, we are not in so bad situation as in the 30s. Okay, th thank you very much. I'd, I'd now like to, to move on to Mr. Georgi Perinsky, uh, also uh, a, a deputy prime minister before I'd uh, finished my PhD, uh, rather, rather worrying, uh, and um, also a uh, uh, de deputy prime minister of Bulgaria between uh, 95 and, and, and 97, and chairman of the National Assembly of Bulgaria from July 2005. Uh, I listened uh, intently on your, on your fine, fine speech, but one thing really disturbed me is the, the subject of the sh shadow banking uh, system because surely we all knew this was going on. This was not something very small and, and hidden away. It may be called the shadow banking system, but we all knew it was going on. And I, I'm wondering um, whether this, this, this shadow banking system problem will not rear its head up very soon again. I mean, the issue has not been solved. So I really, I would like to know two things, really. Uh, uh, how come this was not a major topic out there publicly beforehand, and whether we have solved the problem? Well, actually, I, I spent uh, the, the first part of my speech on uh, the United States because, as Mr. Post said, 
the crisis was, uh, the financial crisis was generated in the financial system of, of the United States. And um, the shadow banking system is something which grew over the past two decades, it seems, as a parallel system to the normal banking system, precisely because it was outside the scope of regulation. And uh, clearly there was awareness that all these uh, private banks and hedge funds and uh, different other entities were there operating, but it was felt that, uh, you know, uh, it's part of the way the market functions. Now, here, of course, uh, we come to the, to the question of the effectiveness of regulation in the first uh, instance, because as the professor pointed out, uh, the uh, real attraction has been not to join a, a regulatory agency, but to become a high-powered banker, preferably in the shadow banking sector. And this is something which is the result of the way uh, profit in, uh, motivation works. And this is part of the essence of the capitalist system. So here we arrive at the issue that the professor uh, mentioned. Is there such an oxymoron as social capitalism? Is such a thing at all possible and workable? Uh, now, we have been trying with, with all the rest on the panel to, to help uh, the young people listening to us to try to gain a sense of orientation as to which way should we be proceeding and, and what lies in store, let's say, uh, past this uh, sharp eruption of the crisis. And we have been maybe shocking you uh, with all the crises that are looming and all the uh, threats, etc. And to my mind, at least, uh, the uh, overall uh, sort of um, awareness we should come uh, away with is that the economic system needs not only, <laughs> strictly speaking, financial regulation, but political uh, balance. Uh, that is balancing uh, market incentives and profit incentives with equity considerations, after all. If you let it simply freely expand and develop uh, and, and leave it to its own uh, workings, then, as was mentioned, you have these huge divergences in levels of income between a, a small, uh, you know, and uh, you have uh, all these processes that one mentioned as to Africa, uh, all these inequities that generate. And you have to uh, try to develop a sufficiently uh, effective, excuse me, the word may be more in the economic uh, department, political system of democratic control. And I want just want to mention a book which I'm sure many people have read here of uh, Super Capitalism by Mr. Reich, R Robert Reich. Uh, it came out just on the eve of the crisis, I think, in 2006, 2007. His basic point being that over the past 20 years, a uh, different type of capitalism developed in the United States, which was very much market-driven. And his point is that consumers and investors gained from this. But at the same time, we as citizens lost because inequalities grew to extreme uh, proportions. And political representation did not lead to any kind of improvement in the lives of people that they expect when they go out <coughs> to vote. Now, how much consumers have gained, I don't know, after all that happened to them as uh, uh, house uh, purchasers, etc. But really the question is, how, how do we uh, balance the, the, the market system with a political democratic system of control, which can provide efficient financial regulation, which can provide effective uh, global governance. And uh, one of the issues which I thought might come up is the example of Scandinavian countries. Is that a model which can be reproduced? Is it what it re represents to be? I'm, I'm not quite sure 
as to the exact workings. But there seems to be a way of combining economic efficiency and social equity, because on both scales, these countries rate, uh, rate very highly. Thank you very much. Um, pr uh, Professor um, Pant, uh, we know you as an explorer and uh, as, as a critique of, of, of global governance or organizations. And I was wondering if you would uh, uh, comment on, t on two questions. Uh, can there be, as, as Georgi Prinsky says, a, a, a moral capitalism? And also, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a, uh, uh, a critique of global governance, did you perhaps see the, uh, uh, the financial crisis coming before the rest of us? Well, I, n I was not trained in astrology, only in anthropology, <laughs> so I couldn't foresee it. But anyhow, many sensible people sensed it before that. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I, we heard from our Greek gentleman that uh, the crisis is not economic, but only financial. Uh, I beg to disagree. Uh, crisis, the financial crisis is a trigger. It is what triggered. The crisis is very structural. It's economic. Uh, it's economic. The crisis is economic. There is a the crisis, I see the crisis, uh, will keep on, well, well, I keep on traveling from Middle East to Far East to uh, South America and Europe, and I sense the crisis perceived differently in different places. Uh, but what I find common every place from North America to, to Far East Asia is that the crisis is, is, has, has something more psycho social or psychocultural uh, s uh, dimension. There is a crisis of trust. The biggest capital of capitalism is trust and not greed. And we have been confusing that the greed is the driving factor of capitalism. It's not. It is a trust. And the trust becomes secondary, greed becomes primary. We have been celebrating greed. The finance guys, young, yuppies, and, you know, these uh, rampant people, they have been given the very high status in the society. And this is the result, you see. When you, are, when you are giving more importance to the one who manage and handle the beehives with the glove full of nails and lick what bee comes in their glove instead of the bee themselves who collect the nectar and create the honey. So here we have been celebrating the beehive holders. And the other problem is, is also the moral untenability of the system. There is, a, there is an angst. There's nobody. Yesterday was very, very interesting when I saw that if I would ask also in this hall again, how many of you really believe that your children and grandchildren will have a great life thanks to technology? capitalism, good regulation, and global governance. I doubt how many hands will, ha will raise today. There is, there is a deep, unconfessed We, we, could, take, we could take a quick vote on that if you want, Professor Pant. Uh, Excuse me? We could do a quick vote on that if, if you if We you could want. do that. Okay, we'll do that at the end, yeah? Why not? Okay. No, 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 no. Now? Okay. How many of you believe that your children and your grandchildren will have a very nice time compared to us thanks to technology, thanks to global regulation, thanks to new, more sophisticated mechanism of, of managing economy. Please raise the hand. Not enough. <laughs> anyway, this is interesting. How many think that we may run into more trouble? You see? We have a very so pessimistic we have audience. A, we have a problem of angst and trust. And economy is, economy is, not, only, economy is not only the bricks and the, and the meat, uh, bread. Economy is test. Economy is trust. 
Economy is a lot of things. There are factors, there are values, there are tangible. And an economic system is not an order. There are many unintended consequences. There are many rapid discontinuous changes. There are so many other things. And so, you know, I'm a professor of economics. But what I, more and more I look into it, the more I realize that nothing is so predictable. The unpredictability of unintended consequences is very deep. And if we don't take into consideration all that, and we have learned, not learned the lessons of 1997 crisis of the Asian financial crisis of 1997, we haven't taken note of the Tango Bond crisis of Argentina. Tango Bond, you remember Tango Bond? The 1998 crisis of Russia, ruble crisis in Russia. And we, we haven't learned if the recent crises. So many lessons have been missed. We still keep on believing that we can keep on changing car and putting on more and more shirts and coats on our body. So this is here, and then there's the angst of the future. So this is all about much more deeper, this crisis. And worse is coming in terms of job. You'll see that. You'll remember that. It will not take a long time. The worst is coming. It's creeping. It's crawling, but coming. And so, uh, <laughs> please. Okay, a, a bit of optimism now, uh, uh, Mr. Gerasimo Sandini. That's pretty hard to do that. But, um, but that, to respond actually to your comment, uh, surely there have been problems uh, in the economy, in the real economy. But those problems have been manageable and we know how to deal with the business cycles. The great recession we have faced in the recent years was uh, provoked by the financial crisis. And we have to address ourselves uh, to the question of controlling the global financial system to perform its traditional functions and to move away from the shadow banking, you said, or the casino banking, as I said. And uh, this is the, th the challenge before us. Now, whether one is an optimist or a pessimist, uh, I think that's, that's not the question. The thing is that uh, what do we must do, really, to avert future crisis and to move ahead. And I think it is in our hands, it is our responsibility to chart a course of events at the national and international level for a better future. So this is what we have to discuss, not so much what has happened and why that happened, but uh, what we're going to do from now on. And since I have the floor, just one remark uh, to add. You mentioned about uh, the integrate, the, 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 the financial integration uh, or rather the fiscal policy integration in the euro. But before we do that, we have to complete uh, our monetary integration. We have a very funny monetary system in the European Union. Not, we need not only better supervision, but uh, we need also to have a banking of last resort. This is a funny thing we have. We have a European Central Bank but we do not have a bank of last resort. Now, the European Union is not an optimum currency area. And uh, of course, you do have different problems at the same time in different countries, in Germany, in Greece, in, in Spain, in Italy, and so forth. Now, we do have this problem that uh, the financial markets are treating different member countries differently. And Europe, collectively, the European Bank is not in a position to deal collectively to face this problem. Why? Because we do not uh, have a banking a, 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 a of last resort. And I don't know why the European Central Bank can lend other banks, but they cannot lend directly states. I do not know why the European Union cannot face the financial crisis we have today by floating a European Union bond. So we will avoid uh, the, uh, the, the market risks uh, that the specific countries are facing. And I want to pose this uh, question. We have now, we have seen 
a speculative movement, first against Greece and now about, uh, against uh, Portugal, perhaps tomorrow against uh, Spain, against uh, uh, Italy. This is actually speculation against the stability of the euro. Now, we have actually to complete our work uh, on a monetary union in the European Union. We haven't done that yet, and this is really what we have to do. Thank you very much. Well, well luckily we have um, in Mr. Davorin Kashin not only an economist, but uh, somebody with uh, impressive uh, government experience. And uh, as Deputy uh, Prime Minister, a Minister for Economic Relations and Development, uh, um, I'd like to pose as well as, well as this question, a, a, another one as well, uh, which mixes together the politics and economics. Um, the, the banks received a tremendous amount of, of money, I mean, untold billions. And isn't there a, uh, a, a political problem now when we, we've talked about state aid earlier on in the, in the, the proceedings, but it, it must be difficult now to, to, on the one hand, to hand out billions to, to banks who, one could argue, caused the problem in the first place, but then when unemployment rises, when governments have to face the consequences of the financial disaster, um, that uh, governments then uh, be forced to, to hand over state aid in order to even up the, the, the political uh, calculus? Uh, the question of banks, which is raised uh, very much in uh, this time of uh, crisis and recession, uh, is, uh, I would say, also very controversial as, uh, as, uh, controversial as, as you have stated. On one hand, uh, it is quite clear uh, if we allow uh, banks to, uh, to fail, if we allow that, uh, that people are losing, uh, people who, who were trusting in banks, that they are losing their money, then of course it is, uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, it is a cat economic catastrophe and uh, uh, all means are, are, uh, are good or all, all means are, are acceptable in order to prevent uh, such, a, uh, such a banking shock. This is also one of the lessons from uh, uh, 1929, uh, 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 where the, the most severe, co the one of the most severe consequences of the crisis on Wall Street uh, was uh, w uh, were the bankruptcies of the banks, uh, where people were not uh, were not uh, uh, rewar uh, rewarded, and that many uh, small saver, uh, savers lost their money. So uh, we should always, no matter what is the philosophy of uh, economic policy, but uh, government should always take care about the small people, about the workers, about the, uh, about the uh, small uh, savers, and they shouldn't be just a small change in, uh, in a big, uh, big economic gains. But on the other hand, we also have examples when, uh, uh, when the governments were too generous with the banks, with takes, uh, with take taxpayers' money, and, sa uh, and uh, saving the banks brought uh, the country into a uh, much uh, deeper crisis, as we see, for instance, the case of the case of Dominican Republic in, two uh, in 2002, uh, where a bankruptcy, or when the government tried to prevent the bankruptcy of, uh, of, of a big bank, brought the whole country into, uh, into a deep uh, crisis, much before 2008, where uh, the whole world is on the, on the edge of, of the crisis. So, um, uh, so uh, the, ba the banks should work, and the banks are, trust in the banks is one of the, uh, most important elements of the of the uh, of the economic uh, system, but of course, in the other uh, in the other hand, the question is, uh, what are the measures that the governments and the central banks have in order to control banks and uh, and in order not to uh, uh, not to be forced into too costly interventions uh, to save the banks and to, to save the uh, to save the economic system because. The banks are too important, uh, too important to fail. And as, uh, uh, as we see, uh, mechanisms that are preventing, uh, lo uh, preventing losses when the, uh, b when the bank fails are rather, uh, are rather costly. Uh, what uh, was uh, rather well done in, uh, in the wake of uh, the 2008 crisis and what uh, prevented the, uh, the depression, uh, the 
the deepening of the depression, uh, were successful intervention into the, ba uh, into the banks, but they were costly. Uh, as far uh, 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 we can remember the dramatic, uh, uh, the dramatic uh, events in the 2008, where in the, uh, in the first half of 2008, already the mortgage, mortgage, mortgage crisis uh, was at the, uh, at the horizon, uh, but uh, uh, the deepest fall of trust uh, 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 appear, appeared when Lehman Brothers went uh, bankrupt. Uh, so it is very important to keep banks in rather, uh, in rather, good, uh, in rather good condition. But on the other hand, uh, government and central banks should not uh, keep themselves as hostages of, uh, of the bankers. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a field where, uh, where I agree with my colleagues who who said that uh, regulation of financial markets and of, uh, of banking and also regulations, uh, uh, regulations within European monetary system is, uh, if we go, go to Europe is, uh, is, uh, uh, is necessary and also global coordination of such uh, regulations. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, I will be um, throwing open uh, the uh, discussion to the, to the floor, but um, as I've spied a, a professor of economics who's just sneaked in rather late uh, to the corner, uh, I always wanted to do this to, to, to put the most difficult question to the, to the latecomer. Um, Rick van der, der Plug, uh, in Britain, I'm sure you're aware of the debate regarding uh, uh, short selling and, and hedge funds. And uh, I, I'd, I'd really be interested to know, possibly uh, with a theoretical background explanation on it, um, uh, where, where you stand on this, because uh, for much of the, the financial crisis, in, in, in Britain anyway, the, 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 the short sellers and the hedge funds were the new boo people the, the, who were, were blamed for this crisis. But then we've heard that uh, without short selling, the market cannot operate properly and that hedge funds are not to blame after all. And So uh, what is the, uh, the, the economic perspective on this? Well, this? I don't have anything against hedge funds. Um, uh, they, in a way, they're like hyenas, they're sharks. Even if they increase so volatility so of the market? So they smell when there is something wrong in a particular company. So, for example, they smell when it's possible to, to, to cut it up in three or four companies and sell all the separate bits and they get more money, they do it, and they quickly. But they're very short term. So there was a good book uh, many years ago by Michel Albert, Capitalism Contra Capitalism. And he had this system about the Anglo-Saxon form of capitalism and the more Rhinelandic form of capitalism. Where the Rhinelandic forms of capitalism had more defenses against takeovers, including by hedge funds. And they were much more long-termism. So I think what we've learned from the crisis is that we want also our companies to more have a stakeholder society, that we go to a more longer-term future. But that, that's not enough. I was just reacting to the previous two speakers. Uh, I mean... In my country, you see about the boss, our Minister of Finance, and uh, he's a good friend of mine, and he basically we have the philosophy, banks should not be so big, because we can't afford two big banks to fail. Because if a bank is really that large and it fails, the whole economy topples over. So if you have five or six smaller banks, that's better. So that goes against the past trend. Secondly, we have to think very much about what do banks do. Now, when I talk about these testosterone young boys, they all want to get into proprietary trading. What is proprietary trading? Is that you trade for your own money, i.e. your money. So really you want to split up banks between the retail banks and the more hedge fund or the more, more speculative forms of banking. So if a speculative agency like a hedge fund, a couple of hedge funds have really burned their fingers and have gone bankrupt, that's all right. So that, that's on that front. Then on our Greek friend, um, I have the uh, pleasure of having been co-author of many papers with two previous ministers of finance of Greece. So you may know one of them, uh, Nikos Christodoulakis, and, and the other one, the slightly more corpulent fellow, uh, George Alakoskoufos. Now, Nikos was a, a left-wing Marxist in the times that we were still writing papers together, but he was hated in Greece being a social democrat because he said he's a technocrat. Well, then you know your political career is bad. But he actually did lots of things. Then George came. Yeah, I yeah, know, I know. But then George came over, and then the question is really, 
Maastricht, as my neighbor said quite correctly, forbids bailouts. It's unconstitutional. So then the question is not whether banks can go bankrupt, but whether countries can, small countries, Portugal, Greece can go bankrupt. Well, maybe they can, maybe they cannot. But the thing, what, what, is it, what has happened with Greece? Greece has been just as strange as many other countries. I, I happen to know because I've had big arguments with both of these two people. Actually, the former is more my friend, but the other as well. Is that, of course, they've lied many times. Not only to the European Commission, not only to the European Central Bank, also to the people of Greece. You will say no, but those people in charge have actually said, yes, we should have been uh, more open. That's translated, that means we've lied. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 now that may not be true. Or not, I'm not arguing whether it's not true or not true because you're Greece and you will know better or may not know better. But, but the issue is it's never going to be bailed out by printing more money because that will affect the stability of the euro. What might happen is that some big governments in Europe may give some loans, some transition loans, to aid the political process of getting Greece's books in order. But they'll do it reluctantly because you say no, but whether you believe it or not, in most of the countries which have to do the funding, of these loans. They believe, well, they say, well, actually, Greece got itself in the... I mean, the capitalist system is ruthless. If they see there is shit, they will target it like hell. And the reason is that they had a reason to target it, because the deficits were much higher than they were published. And so you get these forms of what the market calls a correction, but it's really the ruthless pinpointing, just like the hedge funds are able to do that. They also be able to pinpoint the, the thing. So I think what will happen is that the Maastricht Treaty will not get uh, rewritten. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's impossible. Sorry. But it may be the case that either via the IMF or via the uh, particular couple of big countries in Europe, there may be some temporary loans. Loans are always temporary, but I always say when I give a loan, it's temporary <laughs> uh, to, to help solve to get Greece uh, uh, belts tightened and to have a smooth transition process. But it's going to be a tough time for Greece. I say this as a social democrat, so I'm not trying to be too tough, but there is, there is, there is an awkward message to be told to the citizens of Greece. Okay, I have to give the right to reply, definitely. Yeah. Wow. First of all, the speculation is not the target is not Greece, is not Spain, is Euro. Uh, but uh, since you raised the Greek case, let me raise myself three issues. First, statistics. Yes, but uh, let me respond to that. Uh, in Greece, we say that um, in the scale of sin, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Now, what actually happened with the Greek statistics is a sad story. We, Greece got into the monetary union by showing a government deficit below 3% of GDP. Now, that was at the time of your friend uh, Nikos Christodoulakis. Now, the calculation referred primarily and was affected by armament expenditure. Unfortunately, Greece spends about 4% of GDP on armament. Now, it does make a big difference how you calculate government expenditure, as armament expenditures. If you count the date you order the armaments or the date you receive the armaments. Now, what Christodoulakis did with the accord of the Eurostat, so it was not the Greek responsibility, it was a joint responsibility, they calculated uh, armament expenditures on the basis of delivery of goods. When Alogos Kufis came with a new government, with the agreement of the Eurostat, changed the calculation, and uh, we calculated that the armaments are on the basis uh, of payments. So that makes a big difference when uh, you chart uh, this in the year 2003 on the year 2004. So suddenly the deficit 
jump from 3% to 7%. Now, that was not a lie. That was a different way of calculation which was done with the agreement of the European Commission. Okay. Now, what happened from the 7% to the 12% we have now was indeed a government failure. Just one minute, because you, I can't let this, uh, I happen yeah. to be, uh, I, did, I did finance for very many years, so, so it's true what you said, this blip. Yeah, but, but, but you, you did say you lied. But that's, that, that, that's a pretty heavy. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but, but that well, wasn't so. I haven't finished my sentence yet. Yeah. So, but it's a temporary blip. Hmm? If it goes, if it's just a question of whether you counted at the beginning or the end, it's yeah. just a temporary blip. It's not a structural thing, which is what's going yeah. on now. So it could only explain temporary and then it should go down again. If it's just an ordering question, whether it's a, whether you cut it at the beginning or no, at the end of the transaction, yeah, but it's just it, always it, it a temporary does, blip. But I think the criticism, anyway, the criticism was made is that uh, why you reported a deficit below 3% when actually the deficit was 8%. And all I'm saying is that, that that depends really how you calculate armament expenditure. That was not lying. That was an agreement. And this statistical hocus pocus was not done by the Greek statistical office alone. It was done with the Eurostat. Okay? Now, then I agree with you that uh, there has been a jump in the deficit uh, from 7 to 12 percent. That was a government failure. We had elections. The government changed. The government now has a stabilization plan, and uh, the European Commission uh, community has agreed to that, and we're going to implement it. Now, the pressure on, on Greece is uh, uh, done by speculators, which has, as you know, invested billions of dollars betting on depreciation of the euro. And this is the point I made earlier that uh, our monetary union is incomplete. We do not have a financing a banking of last resort. To have a complete monetary union, you should have a financing of last resort. Can you imagine the United States and the central bank, the, 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 the Federal Reserve Board, cannot uh, be the, uh, the bank of last resort? This is actually what the speculators are saying. They're saying that uh, the euro is based, is constructed on a shaky basis, and that's why they are betting on, uh, on, uh, against uh, the euro. And I think that the response of the European Union will be actually to put uh, its, the monetary house in order. Okay? Did you want to, to reply to this? Uh, not on Greece, but uh, on the stability of the euro. Uh, the euro was under speculation from uh, its state of birth on. And you remember that it, was fa it had fallen below one dollar and it had risen ab uh, above uh, 150. Uh, so <coughs> I, I think the correction movement of, of the euro is not a catastrophe for uh, the monetary union. Uh, some uh, People will uh, applaud, will applaud uh, the uh, downing of the euro vis-à-vis -vis of the dollar because the U Europe uh, as a whole will be more competitive uh, worldwide. Uh, I just wanted to make one more remark about uh, our original subject, reforming capitalism. Well, I, I don't believe in moral capitalism at least in one generation. We might come there, it's a, it might be an idealistic goal, and a lot of reforms have to be done in order to get there, but we will not get there tomorrow. But what we can have tomorrow is a reduction of the risk appetite of the bankers. We can do that by reducing the leverage and by rising the capital ratio of the banks, this goes through the Basel, Basel II process and can be supervised by uh, the European Central Bank. And to what, we, uh, what we also can do is to impose a proper 
risk management to every bank. Liquidity management and risk management. Example, forbidding uh, to risk own funds in, in hedge funds or uh, things like that. This can be done through regulation. It can be done tomorrow or next month, but uh, a moral capitalism, we, we, we have to wait a little bit. Okay, uh, I think that'll be the, the final word there. The, the president has spoken. Uh, there's no moral capitalism. I'd like to open this up. Uh, we're running very late, but I'm sure we have time for three or four questions, I think. Hi, I'd just like to ask a question about growth. Uh, it, it seems to me that the, the entire... Uh, system and, and even post the crisis and the way we're talking about reforming it relies on a restoration of growth to four or five percent and our economic leaders and our political leaders insist that this is what we have to aim for. Why, why is there no discussion around the concept of maybe reducing our appetite for growth and just relying on uh, a system that, that just uh, replaces itself rather than always trying to increase? What, what is this desperate attempt to increase about and why can't we look at that as a source of the problem? Would anybody like to argue for reducing growth or against reducing growth? Against, uh, um, for reducing growth would be maybe a, a, a pass over to Gil. Well, uh, I hope you, you join in this because really it comes back to the way the whole economic system is functioning. And uh, what the professor was uh, pointing out is that the repercussions in the real economy will be for some long time uh, even stronger in the way of uh, lack of employment and uh, depressed living standards. And here, uh, you know, I've been impressed by the fact of the vote, which was overwhelmingly skeptical, let us say, of the possibility of just improvement by the way the system works and our concentration on how do we regulate the financial system. Because even with the best of regulations, I feel that the basic problem which uh, Professor van den Plug mentioned of the ruthlessness of the capitalist system, the, the profit drive which creates uh, imbalances and actually Professor if we speak of the European Union, uh, exacerbates differences between the strong and the weaker points and then the predatory uh, interests uh, pounce on a weak uh, member requires a much more comprehensive set of policies aiming to overcome the basic uh, structural uh, differences uh, leading to, to, to these problems. So certainly, uh, there is no doubt that you need a financial system which is, before it is regulated, it is structured in a different way. That there is the separation between investment banking and retail banking, which was the, what happened after the Great Depression, which, what was eliminated under the Clinton administration. And of course you need a whole system of regulation. But this does not take care of the real economies, disequilibria, which are generated by a free quote-unquote market system. Because, Professor, you come from Netherlands where it is Shell and Unilever and you are a country which uh, has a, a, a hugely uh, competitive and, and, uh, and profit-generating system. A country like Bulgaria, which is a member of the Union, uh, has been able to run surpluses on the, the budget at the expense of perhaps a million and a half people leaving the country in the past 10 years, of uh, females going to Greece to work as house at attendants and as service uh, uh, of the lowest uh, quality, earning four or 500 euros which is twice the average salary in Bulgaria, and keeping families functioning back in Bulgaria. So if you permit that type of disequilibria, but also 
there is the problem in, in advanced capitalist societies themselves. If one reads the Financial Times, there was an editorial 10 days ago which said, uh, let us look at our society, what is happening. Uh, there is an increasing difference in uh, living uh, conditions. <coughs> there is a very poor rate of upgrading uh, young people moving into higher uh, levels of uh, income because of inherited, uh, uh, so to say, lower household uh, origins. And the newspaper says we will be coming back to this issue. So this is again the way the market uh, capitalism is functioning today. And uh, morality is something which you cannot expect of an economic system. You have to structure it in a way that it generates uh, better outcomes. Seems a professor. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, you know, uh, I think we should, we all people concerned with the economy who teach or research in economy, we should be a little bit more humble and accept that we have failed. Uh, is economic is not an order. I, you know, you have to make a uh, comparison between a swimming pool where the borders are well neat and clean and well lined uh, it is not like that. It's, that is order. You can make an order of a policy, an institution with order. But economic system is something that there is society. There is a lot of other things. And its uh, system is more organic. It's like a pond, a natural pond, not like a swimming pool. So you can't really manage it. And any pretension of driving it very well and perfectly a foolproof ma macro management, that is, this is where is that we need humbleness. And you know, uh, about about uh, time to time, we may need some specific technical regulatory adjustment. I agree with the proposal of President Obama of um, splitting the bank's functions of the commercial retail banking from the investment and merchant banking. I agree with that, and that has been already done by the Roosevelt, by the time of the Depression. Actually, Bill Clinton, this this so-called third way guys, Clinton, Blair. These are very smiley. These are the people who have created this plastic money. The sum of the basic for this, this, this bubble was created. And, and it's very strange. It's, it's, it's a mockery of democracy. Blair went to war with Iraq when 80% of the British people didn't want to do war. And the same thing about economic system also. So here, this, but again, the technical, uh, momentary technical regulation Piling up more regulation won't really solve our epochal problem. You know, there, there, Titus Livius, a Roman historian, he used to say, plurime leges corruptissima republica. More, le more laws, more corrupt is the republic. So, you know, we have to remember. So, and you know which is the country with the more number of laws? Italia. <laughs> and which is the country more mafioso? and more, one of the most corrupt country in Europe, Italia. So laws are not going to save us. We, what are going to save us is some paradigm change. In, and the economic, and you know, the idea is that it is the financial crisis and not economic crisis. This is going, it's a very, creating another cosmic illusion, another Maya. It's not, it is saturation of a system. Too much of product, too many shirts, too many cars. Too many shoes. There's too much of everything. <laughs> it's a saturation. And now, you know, Dubai, look at Dubai. China is the next Dubai. You'll see it. It's 1,000 times Dubai. It's 1,000 times Dubai, next, next bubble. So we have to be very careful about that. So there's need of some, maybe some regulatory, uh, technical, momentary adjustment is needed. But again, the economists are always talking on the one hand, and on the other hand, that's why Roosevelt said, give me one one-handed economist. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, Catherine Marshall. Uh, I want to highlight briefly that I think your question is a really important one, uh, worthy of having uh, a conference here about it. I was at a conference a couple of years ago, and it was um, one of these conferences where brought together very diverse people who had very different opinions. And there was one person who said, just imagine a China where every family has a car and a refrigerator. And about an, uh, 
three quarters of an hour later, someone else said, let's imagine China where every family has a car and a refrigerator. But for one of them, it was the dream. That was actually Michael Moore. Uh, and for the other, it was the end of the world. Uh, and what was interesting is that they didn't hear each other. They simply, they had no sense that they had both said the same thing, but meaning something very different. And this growth argument is going on all the time. I was actually at a, the Parliament of Religions in December and uh, was working on poverty issues, and there was another track that was dealing with ecology, and we finally, at the very end, had one meeting where we got together. And I was talking about how, for the in, in many circles, in the economist circles, it, the, this, this principle that if you don't have economic growth, you have nothing. You have no jobs, you have no money for education, you have no money for health, you have no money for culture, uh, you, the whole engine, the whole thing is structured around the need for growth, and particularly this issue of jobs. Uh, jobs is a very moving issue when you have so many young people and a population going from 6.5 billion to 9 billion and half the world's population is living with something that, that none of us would think is even remotely decent. Uh, so, uh, so you have this sort of principle. Is in, in the World Bank, the poverty report, that was the war was how, whether you had only growth or whether you had growth plus investment in human capital. The ecologists jumped all over me. I mean, they said, we've simply got to have a completely different paradigm. And, but there was no conversation. So I think the point is that these are two very different ways of looking at the world, and we can't solve it today uh, with these different voices. But it is, it's a question that I think needs to be addressed seriously by the people who see the world in these different ways and away from the romanticizing growth and romanticizing going back to the past. Uh, and uh, besides all that, what was, uh, what was already told about the, econo uh, about the growth, uh, no growth will freeze the existing inequalities. Uh, and uh, we, don't need, uh, we don't need to go to China. We just uh, uh, to see how, uh, how different the, uh, the living standards are within European Union. We have countries, countries with 30 or 40,000 uh, GDP, uh, 40,000 euros GDP per capita, but at the same time, in the same European Union, we have countries with uh, five or 6,000 euros GDP per capita uh, with no growth. Uh, also, uh, European Union has uh, no uh, uh, has uh, no go uh, no development goals. Uh, there are uh, the, the integration processes are stopped. So even for European Union, which is uh, considered as uh, one of the most uh, developed economies uh, in the world, uh, growth economic growth is uh, important. Uh, also, because of internal structure of the of the European Union. Thank you. We have another question. I'll try what and about donkeys, <coughs> is it? No, no, no donkeys this time. Um, look, if, if I was able to uh, synopsize what I've uh, learned over the last uh, day and a half, uh, I actually wrote it down. Um, we got here by untrammeled greed and uh, unbridled uh, financial transactions, uh, a failure to prepare for cycles of uh, uncertainty, an unwillingness, and to get out of it, we're facing an unwillingness to undertake expensive remedial action, which may help other people other than ourselves. And I knew that I had heard those themes somewhere before. And I, I looked around, and I found them in a really old guidebook. Only they were called um, avarice and usury. They were called the Good Samaritan. And... I was wondering, since we are the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, is it not that we have to make a cultural shift in the way that we define success and happiness in the world? And with the risk of uh, overstimulating uh, Professor Pant, I'd like to leave that question with the panel. I, I've got control of the microphone, so I'll, uh, I'll give somebody else a go first. Uh, would you like to? I am, as you heard what I said, I uh, can only agree with you. 
um, I think, uh, but it's very difficult, it's very easy to say, but very difficult to do, as we have seen, because we are all human beings. We have tried this for thousands of years and always failed at the end, or, or at least maybe not always in the personal level, but largely so. So we can say, don't worry, be happy. So that's, uh, it, it, go, it goes badly anyway. So, uh, but uh, but um, at the same time, of course, all those steps, um, they can help, those different uh, steps what we are taking in the world. I'm very skeptical on the, our ability to learn and avoid the next crises. They will come. They will come. Don't worry. Uh, and uh, but at the same time, the best answer to all those crises is this very simple, naive, and often told slogan: "We must change ourselves. Start from this, because we are not mentioned one of the biggest diseases in the modern world, which actually stops, especially in the developing world, the economical development, corruption. This is the moral, moral thing, and this corruption is is a real economical problem." It's a very deep problem when we start to look why a lot of things are happening. This is the very simple word corruption, which again is uh, to avoid the corruption is one very simple thing. Don't corrupt, become corrupt yourself. Again, very easy to say. It's, it's not answering very often. And, uh, but, but at the end, it's, it's, it all returns to this one, one same book or, or in other countries, the other books. It, it all returns there. So when we are not understanding this in the world and not making this cultural shift, there will be not too much hope. Thank you. A, a, a very quick comment from Professor Pant now coming up. See you tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay, we, we have one more comment. And enough time for one more comment or question from the back. Yeah, thank you. Just carrying this uh, issue a bit further. Um, this morning we heard about uh, the sustainable development and uh, of course there are uh, dimensions like uh, uh, ecological sustainability, economic, social. Uh, I think we might need something that cuts, cuts a bit across this discussion so that addresses moral issues and what is actually moral su or morally sustainable because most of these problems are phrased in very dramatic terms and without denying any of the dangers or so, uh, you can justify almost anything in terms of uh, sheer survival or so. So we probably need a discussion of what is morally sustainable, what might be culturally sustainable, and what is the kind of uh, society we'd like to live in in the future. Okay. Yeah, Catherine. Have you had a discussion here already about the gross national happiness? Tomorrow morning. Well, just to... Uh, Bhutan is famous, and it's um, an idea that people are very attracted to. What I find interesting is that there actually is a lot of research and a lot of thought that's gone into gross national happiness. And it is, it's not very far off the triple bottom line. In other words, that you're looking at, you're accepting the benefits of, um, of the creativity and the productivity and the competitiveness, uh, the virtues of competitiveness that go with a market system. Uh, you're looking at the environmental sustainability and you're also looking at the social cohesion and the social. But the additional factor that I think is quite original and which is the one where the, I think it's least developed is what they call spiritual and trying to define what is uh, spiritual sustainability? And it gets to this question of uh, the, the idea, I think, that, that with uh, a higher level of development that you will see uh, a higher level of moral principle, a higher level of ethical discussion. Uh, and some of it is quite interesting that they've, um, they essentially focus on, on respect for life uh, they uh, focus on, in a sense, the question that you were just talking to, the, the mindfulness. Um, they're adapting Buddhist principles but uh, to something broader. But the question of, of the willingness to take responsibility oneself uh, for one's contribution. Uh, so that is, and those are much more important than going to a temple or participating. So I, I think that there's a, there's a lot in that uh, in the in the 
underlying concept to try to address that huge question that you're putting on the table. Thanks, and I'll, I'll give the, the last word with a comment for tomorrow to uh, Georgi Perinsky. Just uh, suggesting a question for tomorrow morning you would like to perhaps consider. Uh, surprisingly, we have not mentioned Somalia and the pirates. And there seems to be a, a Kenyan uh, person in Somalia who does the interface between the pirates and the, you know. And he said, in the final analysis, you can't find, fight poverty with guns. So perhaps the question is, because morally, we will be shifting for at least 100 years, if not more. But is it possible to consider a different policy approach to the piracy issue than sending ships, uh, gunships? Thank you very much. So, so you, ladies and gentlemen, you know the subject for tomorrow is uh, solving the piracy problem. Um, I, I, I have to be... Well, to, to oh, uh, so Sunday afternoon will do it, Professor. But I have to be ethical myself here. I promised Mark I would finish at uh, 10 past 8. We were running way behind schedule, and I'd really like to thank the panel because they, uh, I rushed them through so many subjects, but I, I promised to get them all in, and uh, uh, we really covered a lot of subjects. So many, many thanks to all the panel participants.